Stay hungry. Stay foolish. Before we launch into part two of The Matter With Things with Emil Gilchrist, I just want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to create multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. I know a lot of people have been waiting for this. I certainly have part two of The Matter With Things with Emil Gilchrist. It is a great pleasure to welcome back for part two of The Matter With Things, the author of this wonderful work, The Matter With Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions and the Unmaking of the World, Ian McGilchrist. He who came down from Preshal Moor, the mountain overlooking his home, like Moses with the tablets, <laughs> brought us two books, <laughs> came down and uh, gave us this a magnificent uh, oeuvre, as I said in part one. Welcome back, Ian. Well, thank you very much. It's lovely to be back with you, Aidan. It is as well, and it's great to hear you back in fine fettle. I know you were you were struggling with uh, your health in the your uh, cold in the first uh, instance. So thank and thank you for persisting with that episode. So thank you. Um, <laughs> wonderful feedback, man! Like unbelievable Good. feedback from people, and okay. um, people are Good. like the, some of the comments on YouTube were like. I'm like a kid in a candy store. My copy has arrived. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's great. And it's great to have you back. Oh, well, thank you so much. I was a kid in a candy store as well. And as I said, I appreciated the extra gap because I was on holidays. And in Greece, uh, uh, the the spiritual home to the book, really. <laughs> well, indeed, yes, yes. When part one of the book, you addressed the means to truth in the sense of the faculties with which we are endowed for this task. And you take these to be attention, perception, judgment, apprehension, emotional and social intelligence, cognitive intelligence and creativity. Now we don't stand a hope of diving into each of these today. But I felt attention was so necessary. And you've written extensively on attention in your other books. And I thought maybe we'd touch on that before diving into more of the philosophical chapters that we've both agreed on, perhaps percep perception, definitely perception and intuition. And I thought we'd start with attention because you say attention changes the world, how you attend to it changes what it is you find there, what you find then governs the kind of attention you think it appropriate to pay in the future. And so it is that the world you recognize, which will not be exactly the same as my world is firmed up and brought into being. This raises a core question that you pose in the book, what is attention? Early on, my, my um, research into hemispherics showed that attention was a foundational element. And I could see that a lot followed from it, but I couldn't see everything that followed from it. Uh, in due course, I saw it as astonishingly rich and important. One way of thinking about attention is the way in which we dispose our consciousness towards the world. So I'd like to give, first of all, the idea of attention as not just passive, as a blank slate, as something like a microphone or a photographic plate that would register something that comes along. But that it is, and that's why I took the trouble to go through all those other faculties that you mentioned that we bring to bear when we have an encounter with reality. What we find depends partly on what we think we might find. Uh, and in the process of attending to the world, certain things are picked up by us as more likely than others, given the context. And so it, 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 it's never just something that is passive. It's something that comes into being because of an interaction between you, the hearer, the viewer, whatever, and whatever it is that you see or hear. And that makes a colossal difference because, as I say, if you, if, you, if you begin by attending in a certain way, attending to something as though it were a machine, you will find that it's got parts that can be taken apart. And you will find that it, in some respects, seems to 
emulate a machine. But that's because of the kind of attention you've just brought to bear. But if you don't move on to trying any other kind of attention, you'll think, well, I've got it. I'm happy with this. It's a machine. We just carry on with it. The trouble is that the more you elaborate from that first experience, the further and further away from a reality you're getting, because that was just a first attempt. And what one needs is to see that if you pay different attention uh, you see something quite different. A, a very good example for me as, as a doctor is the human body. So uh, in the consulting room, the body is one thing. In the dissection room, it's another. In uh, an artist's studio, it's yet another. If it's the body of my loved one, in bed, then it's another. So what is the body? What is the real body? The answer is that none of these is the real body, uh, but none of them is false either. They are all aspects of something that can stand forth, bring itself into being for us in a completely different way with completely different qualities. And you may say, well, that's just something about the body because it's rather complicated. But no, it's true of anything. And to go back to the, the mountain behind my house, you know, it can be seen in very different ways and, and has been. I, I say this before, but I'll say it again, that this name in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Gallic Talisker is derived from a Norse word, which means the sloping rock. And uh, what that means is a thousand years ago, when Norsemen were coming down to explore this rather treacherous, wild northwest Scottish coast, they knew that this particular mountain that has a rather special outline, a sloping outline, uh, was a sign of something to steer clear of because the bay is notorious for shipwrecks. But we also know that uh, long before Norsemen came, there were Picts, uh, the, the remnants of their brochs, these amazing circular buildings on several levels in which they kept themselves and their animals uh, are there. And for them it was shelter and it was the home of the gods. And then in the 18th century, uh, people came to draw it and paint it. And for them it was a very beautiful form with different textures and colors. And in the 19th century, people became more interested in geology. And they discovered that it was a perfect example of columnar basalt. So you've got people coming and you still get them coming with their shiny yellow hard hats to take a look at this mountain, which is a perfect example of columnar basalt. Um, you know, to a speculator, it might be dollars. Um, to a physicist, it's 99.99% space. And the other 0.01%, we've no idea what it is. So these are, are, are these, are we saying one of these is real and all the other ones are wrong? No, they're all real. They're all true parts of this many sided, many faceted reality. And everything is like this in reality. It depends how we get into a rut of seeing it. And if we get into the scientific reductionist, not, nothing wrong with science, but the reductionist materialist way of thinking about it, then all we see is a heap of predictable matter with nothing else going on, just bumping into one another and producing chaotic results. You mentioned there about the rut, falling into the rut. And, and I often think about that, that as a child, many of us have experiences, and we don't even know what those experiences were that got us into the right rut, <laughs> if you want to call it the right rut, or the, it could have been parenting, could have been teaching, could have been our first manager in an organization. And it made me think about how we both discussed in the last day how not only the Western world, but also the business world in particular has become very mechanistic. And one of the dualistic elements of business that we talk about regularly on the show is exploitation versus exploration. So exploitation is when I've discovered my product or my service, and then I exploit the heck out of it, I make as much money as I can from it. And that often comes at the expense of exploration. So I stop exploring and looking for new opportunities and innovating. And there was a quote I pulled from the book that I absolutely love because you said, like the brain and the fruitful tension between the hemispheres and the trade off between competition and collaboration. And this is the other thing that happens in organizations is that we become competitive 
in a world where we need to be more collaborative than ever before. Yes, <clears throat> and I think what stops us or confuses the picture is the thought that if only we were purely competitive, we'd do better. But the answer is absolutely not. Evolution shows that most creatures survived and thrived because they got the balance between competition and cooperation right. And very much, uh, I would say more than competition, uh, very much uh, cooperation plays the leading part. And together you might call them collaboration. And that, that is really the, the story of evolution, not ruthless competition, with, there is certainly competition, but it's tempered with collaboration uh, mediated by being co cooperative. And cooperation is very often a way of bringing advantages to both parties, <clears throat> whereas competition is bringing a, an advantage to only one. That's right. And I, I, when you talk about competition versus, um, sorry, exploitation versus uh, exploration, um, I don't know whether you're doing that knowingly, but you are in fact perfectly describing the difference between the, the sort of disposition of the left hemisphere towards exploitation and the right towards exploration. And this is not just a nice image um, that I might have made up. It's something that you can observe uh, at the most um, factual clinical level. After somebody has had um, a, a, a stroke in the frontal lobes of the left hemisphere, what it does is, is it means there's no longer any inhibitory control by the sort of mastermind of the left hemisphere on its general tendencies served by the posterior cortex. So if you like, the lid has been taken off the posterior cortex, all the constraints have been taken away, and it's like, yes, free for all. What do we do? We exploit. And so when people have had this, what they sometimes find is that their right hand mindlessly tries to grab and use things, even if it doesn't want them. If it sees something, it automatically picks it up and sees a pen, it picks it up and starts writing. If it sees a hat, it takes it and puts it on, even though it's not necessary, and even though nobody asked them to do that. And you even get uh, situations where somebody sees a photograph or a, or a drawing, and in it there's a handle, and, and their hand goes to the handle in the drawing or the photograph and tries to manipulate it. So that's what happens when the left hemisphere is freed from some of its own inhibitory control. When the thing happens with the right hemisphere, you get a different set of movements. Instead of the, the, the right hand grasping and moving about and trying to get hold of things, you get the, the left hand, the tool of the right hemisphere, exploring. So in gentle ways, it pushes textures. It goes off into another part and finds out what's there. So you can actually see in a very concrete way these two modes of being exemplified in the two hemispheres by these rather unusual um, neurological uh, accidents. I want to emphasize this. The reason the book is so dense is that you explore every case study, like everything is in there. I mentioned in part one about the appendix. And if you ever need any research, just buy this book and go straight to the appendix and you'll find every paper, everything's covered in there. I've never seen so many footnotes <laughs> in any book. So it's it's phenomenal from that respect. I'd love to dive into a couple couple of them, Ian, you mentioned hemi neglect, and I'll let you take that away in a second. But also, there was one that I thought was wonderful. And I'd love you to share a hemi neglect. But this one is, you say how a problem with attention differs from a problem with vision can be nicely illustrated. There is a condition called homonymous hemianopia, and, and please correct me there, in which there is a damage to the optic tract and the patient becomes truly blind, not inattentive to most of one half of the world. But if you compare a person with left homonymous hemianopia with one with left sided neglect, the differences are marked. I'd love to share this. Yes, yeah, so I quoted a lovely piece of research in which these two patients, one with homonymous hemianopia with an actual blindness on one side, the left side, and a, a patient with hemineglect on the left side where they can see perfectly well, but their attention 
is is guided entirely towards the right field of vision, the bit controlled by the left hemisphere. And, and so you get a neglect of what's going on in the left field rather than a blindness. So in the first case, this is the person with the genuine blindness, um, it, the conversation goes like this. Have you noticed any changes in your vision? Yes, my eyesight on the left is bad and I can't read as well as I used to. How would you describe your reading problem? It's just slower than before and more stressful. Sometimes I omit words at the beginning of a line. Often I realize it's only when I get to the end of a sentence and it doesn't make sense. Sometimes when I get to the end of a line, I can't find the beginning of the next, or I skip a whole line. Have you any other problems with your vision? Yes. Sometimes I don't notice people on the left till too late and then I bump into them. What's your sense of direction like when you go out? It's bad. And when there's a lot going on, it takes a lot longer for me to find things, especially when they're on the left. And the f first thing to notice is that this person is not making any excuses or pretending that there's nothing wrong. They're describing exactly what is wrong. But when you see the uh, same questions asked of a patient with neglect, attentional neglect, following a right hemisphere stroke, the tone is very different. The patient doesn't accept responsibility, denies that the same things described by the earlier patient happen, and is generally rather um, annoyed by the examiner's questions. Have you noticed any changes in your vision since you fell ill? No, none that I know of, except there's something not quite right with my glasses. Do you have problems with reading? No, not really. <clears throat> Do you sometimes miss words on one side of the page when you're reading? No, I've never noticed that. Have you noticed that your vision is not so good on one side, for example, on the left? My left eye is fine. Do you sometimes bump into things on one side or overlook people on one side more than you used to? Well, sometimes I bump into things, true, but that's only because there's such a lot of people out and about, and people are so inconsiderate. What's your sense of direction like when you go out? I find everything that I want to find. Well, the, this patient is in denial because they are finding the same difficulties that the patient with the blindness has. They don't see the beginnings of lines. They don't see the whole left side of the world. They do bump into things. Uh, they just say it's somebody else's fault. Uh, and if there's, there's something wrong with their eyesight, it's not because there's anything happened to them. It's because there's something wrong with the glasses. So this is the standard attitude of the right hemisphere when it finds that it's um, not able to see things that it used to see, is to become defensive and to pretend that there's nothing wrong, nothing at any rate that's attributable to itself. The thing I found about that, Ian, and maybe you'll elaborate on this from your perspective, is... It's exactly reflective of corporate disruption. You, <laughs> as a consultant, you might be more right hemisphere oriented or, or bigger picture oriented and come to an organization that's about exploitation and give this information and all of a sudden you get this defensive nature. And it's also what we're seeing in leadership as well. The leaders that are more right hemisphere or whole brained are often considered weaker in a world that has been dominated by the left based on the archaic institutions like re religious orders and indeed armies and the military. And that still pervades so many organizations in society today. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I suppose <clears throat> for most organizations, it's important to be able to get a balance between people who um, do your bidding, so to speak, do the donkey work, and those who actually have the the new ideas, which can't be made to happen to order. So, yeah, the the the, the business about denial there is absolutely true. Um, for example, I've noticed this several times in different kinds of organisation that when people have decided this problem needs to be tackled, what do we do? We have a little 
committee or office established that will make sure that more of this happens. And after a while, you you look at the situation and you find that nothing is really better, their outcomes are no better. And instead of deducing that there might be something wrong with the plan that they put into action, they, they respond that it's just that it hasn't been put into action strongly enough or for long enough. Um, and so you see things that any sort of um, <clears throat> person with their eyes open would have said, that's not going to produce the result you think it's going to produce. When they're faced with that, they don't think there's something wrong with my plan. They just think I need to do more of it. That's so true. I, I'm giggling away to myself here. <laughs> and I'm so, so many of our audience will be the same. They're like, oh, that's exactly our leadership team. <laughs> and uh, the more defensive, the more you know you're in trouble as well. And um, mm. Mm. I wanted to uh, again highlight a, a great another great uh, piece of work that you cite in the book. This is and again I happily correct me with all the pronunciations. It's by Zingerly who pointed out mm. to a patient with a failure of imagination, not fantasy, which is important, but imagination, the creative power that enables us to enter into what is there. His patient can no longer imagine, summon up what it is like to be different. And you say, despite being able to perceive it with his senses, he has lost not just a knowledge of the body now, but of it at any time, past, present and future. And I thought this sounds exactly like the deaf left dominant business world that we live in today. And you also mention here at the end, the work of Eduardo Biziash and the cathedral recollection experiments. Um, Singler had a series of three patients that he described in some detail, including the conversations and the interviews. And um, in one particular case, it was clear that the patient denied that they had a paralysis. These are all right hemisphere stroke patients, okay? So they'd all got some paralysis on the left side. And they all denied that there was anything wrong. But this particular patient not only denied that there was anything wrong, but therefore denied that he could have been different before or should have be different in the future. I, I, he had lost uh, not just part of the spatial uh, 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 spectrum, but of the spectrum in time. So that this was how he should be, this is how he is, paralyzed on the left, completely denying there's anything wrong and completely denying that he was ever different or could be different in the future. That's the point. And that is so fascinating because uh, a couple of um, uh, neuropsychologists um, commented that what happens is it, when things disappear from the patient's world, they don't just disappear in space, they disappear in time. So they just do a complete vanishing act. And the the, uh, the the in a way this is further exemplified by the um, experiment done on the Cathedral Square in Milan. This very famous vision that even people who've not been to Milan might probably know this picture of the cathedral with its many many spires on the front. It's remarkable. It's been described rather unkindly as a wedding cake, and it, it's, it's it's a famous facade. And there is a great Cathedral Square with shops and buildings running down uh, in front of the cathedral. And, and he, these, uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, um, had two patients, both of them had, both of them with right hemisphere strokes and therefore with neglect of the world on the left. And he asked them to stand at the bottom of the square opposite the cathedral and describe what they saw. And in each case, they described rather accurately all the buildings that went down the right side of the square as they looked at the facade of the cathedral, because that was in the right hemisphere of the left hemisphere. But they failed to mention anything else in the square that was over on the, the left side. But then he asked them to imagine, OK, go and walk up to the cathedral, turn round with your back to the cathedral front, and now describe what you see in the square. And this time they d described none of the buildings they just described that were down the left side, uh, sorry, down the right side of the square um, as they had looked at it and were now on the left. Instead, they described the buildings that were 
on the left and were now on the right. So they were able to describe all the, the buildings down the other side of the square, but not the ones that they previously knew on the other side. So that's <clears throat> another example of um, the way in which we're not really dealing just with a kind of a blindness. In fact, there's nothing wrong with the optic system at all. A patient can literally see the whole thing. But a problem with attention in which as far as that person is concerned, something has has, has, has gone into a, a landslide and simply disappeared out of their world. <laughs> you mentioned time there and you termed it, you coined a phrase called dyschronia as well and I'd love you to share that but also you mentioned in this passage about Zytraffer uh, syndrome uh, as well which is also fascinating I thought of that scene from the matrix for example yes well to describe dyschronia it was a term that I um, and a couple of colleagues uh, adopted uh, to describe a condition of a patient who was very unusual. She had Tourette's syndrome, which is a syndrome in which people have involuntary tics and sometimes um, make involuntary explosive sounds or words. Uh, but that probably had rather little to do with the fact that she was referred to us because although a dedicated mother, <clears throat> she had no idea um, where her baby had got to in terms of feeds or when it was time for her to change his nappy or, or to do anything like that. And she also exhibited a wider, complete inability to tell the date. Um, she thought she referred to things as years ago when they'd happened perhaps only a month ago. This is a young woman. Um, and she, she thought there were, I think, something like... Um, 60 hours in a day and 24 minutes in an hour. And, and she just seemed to have complete inability to understand him either objectively or subjectively. She had no feeling of the passage of time. We call that dyspnea. Now, what, what, I, what I explain in the book is that all the aspects whereby we understand time rather than just measure a moment uh, are due to the right hemisphere. All that gives time its depth, its continuity, its flow-like nature comes from the right hemisphere. The closest the left hemisphere can get is by putting together a lot of cold inanimate slices um, and that view of life as having a moment now and another one now and another one now is actually what is experienced in schizophrenia and sometimes in autism uh, which are both uh, very often largely right hemisphere deficit states and you get this in the Zeitraffe phenomenon. Zeitraffe is just the German for um, time-lapse photography. So, in other words, patients with right hemisphere damage, instead of seeing the continuity of movement or flow, saw something like a juddering cine film, lots and lots of slices, uh, and even draw movement instead of, you know, they draw it like a lot of shadows following one another. Um, which is, I mean, there's a lot to say about that. And in fact, it's one of the big topics of the book. Much, much later in part three, I, I have a whole chapter on time and another one on flow to which it's very closely related because flow in space and flow in time are, are both very important. You said the matrix. Yes, yes. This is beautifully illustrated um, in a case reported, I think, by Jeffrey Cummings of a patient who having a shower and in the shower had a right hemisphere stroke and suddenly instead of the um, the water rushing out of the shower head in a way that caused a blur of movement he could see every single drop suspended in space and they seemed to be suspended when he looked at them but that as he looked away he could see out of the corner of his field of vision that they speeded up again but as soon as he looked direct at them they froze um, and he describes it as rather like um, the movement of bullets in the matrix or whatever and, and what is fascinating it is that Jill Bolte Taylor, a quite well known neuroanatomist who had a left hemisphere stroke, did a TED talk, which you can find anywhere on YouTube. It's had something like 
80 million at least views. It's one of the most viewed things on the internet. Um, because there she is, somebody who knows all about her brain, and in, she's in the middle of having a left hemisphere stroke. And she says, she suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm having a left hemisphere stroke. This is so cool. <laughs> She says, but she describes the precise opposite of this other man who had the right hemisphere stroke. I don't know what it is about having showers that causes strokes, but perhaps I'll have a bath from now on. But anyway, the, she she has this stroke, and she says, suddenly, with the left hemisphere stopped, the water seemed to rush and pour out of the tap, and she was overwhelmed by the sense of this pouring of the water, which is the exact opposite with the left hemisphere when that pouring motion stops and you just get little um, dops and, and little almost suspended in middle, middle air, little tiny pieces. I, later again in, in the book, I, I mentioned the extraordinary case of um, Jason Padgett, um, a furniture salesman in Tacoma um, who was, had a night out on the town and was brutally assaulted. Um, and immediately afterwards, his whole sense of not just vision, but as it were, his ability to understand the nature of the world changed. And once again, things that should be flowing were broken up and everything became geometric. Everything looked like a graph. Everything looked like straight lines with um, even a curved surface, something like a balloon. He does a drawing of it. It's made by putting tangents to the outside surface of the balloon, but he can't actually draw the circle of the balloon. He draws a wheel as something approximating to a wheel with lots and lots of straight lines just moving around the perimeter of the wheel, but he cannot see the wholeness of the, of the single movement of the wheel. It, it's all very, very interesting. There's a lot more to say about that too, but these are just, I hope, things that might, um, you know, intrigue people. There's a sort of... <clears throat> irony in that I recognise that it's a long book and it would become a much shorter book if you cut out most of part one in which I'm actually looking at the contributions to reality made dependent, independently by each hemisphere. And so I, I say just for these chapters but not for the rest of the book I'm going to give a like one paragraph summary at the end of the chapter and if you, all you really want to know is the kind of take home message you can just read that. And I hope that people who are not really interested do that. But the thing is that in doing so, you miss these absolutely staggering accounts of what happens to real, ordinary people when something suddenly changes in their brain. And to me, that is such gripping stuff. I mean, you could write novels about it. <laughs> and that's what I mean. You, you go into each of the cases. You, you, you catalogue each of the cases. And in some cases, they're your own patients as well. So... There's, it's not mm. just a collection of all the science and the, the findings from a wide range of disciplines. It's the case studies as well. And it does. You, you do a fantastic job. What I did, just to let you know, is I read the conclusion first and then I read the chapter. So I kind of got, okay. I wanted yeah, my, yeah. to get the whole, <laughs> speaking yes. of the divided brain, and then go into the left looking yes. at the parts to make the whole. So I treated exactly. it that well, way. That might be a very good way of doing it. I there was some other stuff that I, I can't resist um, going into. There was a, a beautiful little. You said this in passing, almost. You said you mentioned the idea of the the fixed stare of the gorgon, for example, that immobilizes and kills in embed in in, tech, in mythology, and that mm. we also feel ourselves immobilized when the spotlight is on us. Yes. Yes. Well, you know that animals, prey animals, are sometimes fixated by the stare of the predator and seemingly are unable to move. So it has this way of fixing. And this is fascinating to me because my view is that the left hemisphere um, turns the massively complex interconnected flowingness of reality into snapshots for which the French word is cliché rather nicely. And so you get cliché little representations which show the fixed uh, thing that is the target of this attention. 
and it literally immobilizes it because it takes it outside of time. To be in time, it would have to be constantly moving. As soon as it's a, a slide, a snapshot, a momentary thing, then it's outside of time and therefore frozen in time as well as frozen in space. So what that kind of a stare, the left hemisphere's stare that it applies to the thing it wants to grasp, it immobilizes it. It immobilizes it in its own mind so that it can grasp it. But curiously, consciousness never being just wrapped up in one head or in another, there may be some interchange between the consciousnesses here in which one powerfully immobilizes the other because the rabbit literally doesn't move away when it should do. You mentioned there the cliche, and it reminded me of, I, I lived in France for a couple of years, and I had the honor of learning French and German, like yourself, a linguist. And uh, one of the great gros mots that you earn, you learn uh, early enough, if you live there long enough, is je m'en fiche. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a beautiful term, uh, well, call it beautiful or not, but uh, it was another one that you you discovered, which is je m'en fichisme total. And, yes. uh, <laughs> and anno so knows you. again, please yes. correct me on my, my uh, pronunciation yes. there. But they're exactly, I wrote about yes. this uh, inspired by your work, because I talked about corporate ano anosognosia, because this idea of uh, when an industry is in crisis, and people are victim, they feel they're victims to cognitive dissonance, essentially, and they ignore the reality of what's going on around them. Well, one of my themes is that the left hemisphere denies all the things that don't fit with its plan or anything that reflects badly on itself. It, it can never be wrong. There can never be a problem. And it's not never responsible for what's happened. It's always somebody else is responsible. Um, and that's very true of our, our world nowadays. People take less and less responsibility for their own lives and blame uh, a hundred other things that have made them how they are. But a nose or gnosia, very easily taken apart. Um, the gnosia is from gnosis, meaning knowledge. Nosos is illness, so nosos gnosia, nose or gnosia, knowledge of illness. A nose or gnosia, having no knowledge of your illness. In other words, denial of an illness or a denial of a deficit. And uh, what you refer to there is that a lot of the best of this literature, almost all of it actually, is either in German or French. And, and most of it has never been translated. And so in this book, I do, I, I hope one of the things I may have added to in a small way is, is, is having brought some of this literature into the Anglophone world. But one of the cases, I think it's a case of uh, Ekel and uh, Julia Guerra, um, who have a patient who clearly has a deficit and they say about it that she demonstrated the je m'en fichisme total you know je m'en fiche I don't care you know uh, it's slightly ruder than that but it, you know <laughs> yeah. um, we'll leave it up to is, uh, the French we, that are listening <laughs> we, we, we'll, we'll leave it to people's imaginations but um, that that is a, a really crucial element that people simply don't get the fact that it's wrong and this means in very practical terms that it's much harder to rehabilitate somebody after a right hemisphere stroke because their left hemisphere, which is now active, alone and unbalanced, can't see that there's a problem. Whereas if it's the other way around and they have a left hemisphere stroke, their right hemisphere is functioning and sees clearly there's a problem. So people after a left hemisphere stroke really want to engage with getting better, acknowledge their deficits, are sad about them and are pleased when they begin to improve. But people with right hemisphere strokes, first of all, deny that there's a problem. <laughs> they may not be able to use their left hand at all. They deny there's a problem. And then if they do accept that there's a problem, it's to do with something else that's happened that's nothing to do with them. And of course, it's perfectly all right, and they can go back to work. But if you talk to them about the things that they can't do, which may be extreme, I mean, it may not just be the motor thing that's like to do with the left hand, that might not be so important. But what might be very, very important is that they can't understand what other people mean 
Because actually, we think, or the you know, popular mythology has it, that the left hemisphere is the hemisphere of language. Well, the left hemisphere is the hemisphere of speech in left-handers, but there's a lot more to language than speech. And one very important part is really understanding what is being said. And for that, you need to appreciate context. You need to be appreciating of what is not said as much as what is is said. You need to understand irony, sarcasm, sense of humor. Um, and in, in, in not understanding that, you may get hold of exactly the wrong end of the stick. But this person is blithely unaware that they've got hold of the wrong end of the stick and uh, deny that there's any problem. And, th and uh, there's an example, not a patient of mine, of somebody who had a patient with a right hemisphere stroke. And this person said, I'm absolutely fine. I can go back to work. And the, um, the, the, the psychiatrist said, well, what I've learned from what you've told me and from what your family say, you have difficulty in understanding what people mean. You're forgetful of certain aspects of reality that don't mean so much to you. Um, you can't see certain things that actually belong in a certain <laughs> part of the attentional field. Um, if, a, if a patient came to you as head of HR and said, am I ready to go back to work, what would you say? Well, I'd say, no, no, you, you, you're not fit for work at the moment. You need a great deal more therapy and time and we'll see, keep assessing you. So are you ready to go back to work? Well, of course I'm ready to go back to work. <laughs> so you know, the complete in a, inability to use something they've just seen and apply it to themselves. <laughs> you know, one of the things from reading both this work and uh, the master in his emissary is, and, and then the broad, the, the eclectic reading behind me here is that you develop extreme empathy. So when you know, before I would have been probably more judgmental of maybe a leader who's, uh, I'd say, Oh, they're just a narcissist or a malignant narcissist, or uh, definitely an egotist. And now I'm kind of going, I never know what is going on inside the literally inside the head of that person and how they're attending to the world. And perhaps the reason they got to a leadership position is because of the left hemisphere domination. And now they're now they're trying to lead from that position. And they're incapable of that leadership. And that that just always and I wanted to give you that feedback, because that was that is a gift you get from reading this book as well. But we mentioned it. Sorry, go ahead. No, can I just say about Please. that? Um, it's always a matter of degree, and it varies from case to case. Um, what I don't think I would embrace is a hard position that y you cannot make moral judgments about people because uh, their brains may be functioning in a different way. Um, obviously, if something very uncharacteristic happens and you can see that there's been a stroke or whatever, then that's quite another matter. But if somebody's brain is functioning in a certain way, always has done and probably always Always will do. Um, it's a difficult area. Um, would you just let off psychopaths who murder, torture, rape, and so on? Because it, well, they can't help it really. Because his right ventral medial frontal cortex is abnormal, and you know this is something that gets debated in in the law. And I think on the whole, the sensible position is that you can't. Um, it's partly how much does the person know what they're doing and how much control do they have over it. And in those cases, they do know what they're doing and they do have control over it, although they don't see exactly what it means to other people what they're doing. So they're not able to empathize to put themselves in the shoes of their victims. So it is a very complex area and one in which on the one hand one would completely forgive somebody who in the grip of a total psychosis um, killed somebody uh, and, and afterwards was regretful but at the time wasn't able to know. And one would want to differentiate that at one end uh, of the spectrum from somebody who, you know, really is this just a way of saying they're a bad person that their brain functions in this way. So a complex philosophical issue yeah yeah, yeah well said and and actually it, it made me think of you know some of the some of the de gross deceptions we've seen for example Theranos, elizabeth holmes and enron and, and we work now as well and even uber now has been exposed as well there's a lot of that going on and to your point 
they a lot of those leaders or so-called leaders actually understand that I can manipulate the system here a little bit, and that's very malignant. As as you, it is, said. it is. Um, it is. I thought I thought we'd share as well because. Uh, this links nicely to you mentioned about psychopaths and uh, uh, an episode of psychosis, for example. There's a huge uh, element of um, devitalization, and you share, for example, you know when people have the damage and then they can't put back, literally can't push back a human body back the way it mm-hmm. was if they're given the pieces like the arms and the legs. They're like their legs sticking out of their head and stuff like that. Yes, and I think that's probably uh, something I bring up in a chapter uh, called What Schizophrenia and Autism Can Tell Us. And in it, I compare deficits in right hemisphere functioning in patients where we know that is the case and the phenomenological world experienced by a subject with schizophrenia and one with autism. Now, before I say anything else, I'm aware there are only two aware that there are many, many kinds of uh, schizophrenia and experiences in schizophrenia, and there are kinds of autism too. So, uh, but but nonetheless, there are threads in certain parts that are quite remarkably consistent. And for some people uh, with either autism or schizophrenia, they may begin to see other people as merely automata, and they may say, how do I know that he or she is not just an automaton dressed up in clothes and has learnt how to say certain things? Now, interestingly, that fantasy first comes into the Western mind in uh, Descartes, in his uh, Discourse of Reason. He describes sitting in the window and looking at people moving about in the square below, and he sees coats and hats moving. But how does he know that there are real people inside those coats and hats? Could they just be clever machines? So this is an ancient uh, idea, um, relatively, that haunts us, and it's very common in people with right hemisphere failure, and I I suspect that uh, Descartes, uh, his his work shows all the hallmarks of somebody who was excessively indebted to the left hemisphere's take on the world. Not so simple as to say that it's only that, because he also wrote um, a, a variety of different things at different times in his life. But that is certainly one of the strands. And in The Master and His Emissary, I even point to the fact that he had quite typical delusions and even hallucinations that do occur in psychotic illnesses. But what I think is important for us now is that there are a number of philosophers who, by the way, um, are more than averagely likely to be on the schizoautistic spectrum, uh, something I talk about in one of the chapters on reason in part two. Um, but it, it, there is a, a trend in some of them to imagine zombies. In other words, effectively, that how can we tell that we're not, um, you know, uh, not living, but actually um, cyborgs or, or something of the kind, or, or simply zombies. Um, and, and the notion of multiple worlds in order to get around the idea that there's something special about this world because it's so mind-bogglingly difficult to imagine the circumstances that would allow life to come into being here happening by chance that people have said, well, there must be um, an infinite number of worlds in which uh, everything comes to happen and if everything comes to happen, then this will come to happen. It's a kind of argument that is a non-argument because you're really saying, I'm no longer going to argue, I'm just going to say, well, anything and everything thing can happen so yeah boo sucks you don't have any <laughs> don't have any um, argument to, against me except to say that this is a very extravagant way of dealing with something that ought to be more intelligently approached um, so those things do happen and then I quote schizophrenics who see their loved ones as machines and sometimes with terrible consequences a young man cut his uncle's uh, or stepfather, I can't remember, or uncle's head off with a, a chainsaw looking for the chips inside that made him speak. Um, and uh, so on. So it's, a, it's a quite well-known phenomenon, but the, the devitalization seems to me 
such a strong aspect of our life nowadays. We are devitalizing nature and turning it into a predictable commodity that, that is fully known. The room for wonder and awe, which are the root of a true understanding of things that go well beyond our models, uh, is lost. And instead, a complacent view, typical of somebody who um, likes to think that they know everything, a kind of person who is not usually among the more intelligent. Such people want to think they know everything and therefore assume that there is nothing here that goes beyond. And so we get that attitude towards the natural world. We're devitalizing sex, in my view, partly through pornography, partly through beliefs that it can be manipulated in all kinds of, of ways, according to whatever it is we wish. Um, and we're devitalizing the whole business of everyday being, the, the sort of elan of life, by which I don't mean elan vital, but I mean the, what we normally mean by that elan of life, the excitement, the sense of vitality, of vigor in the organism is, is being squashed by assaults on our senses, on our attention, uh, and so forth. So, yeah, I think that's one of the things. I, I was thinking of writing a book called The Attack on Nature because that seems to me to be the root behind it. I don't know if you've seen, there's a Netflix movie called Don't Look Up with Leonardo DiCaprio. Have you seen that by any chance? So essentially, and I, I, I'm not spoiling it here, there's a, a comet headed straight for Earth and they make it into a news event and you know and, and and you can see this actually happening you, you they make it into a news event the scientist that discovers it brings him on which is leonardo DiCaprio. make it into this worldwide event you know dominates the news but here's the thing ian then along comes uh, a great founder of one of these tech businesses and goes oh no don't because they, they they decide they're going to destroy the comet and obliterate it with rockets and he goes no no that comet could contain precious metals that we need for technology <laughs> and they mine they mine the comet and and i'll let you see it to find out what happens regarding that devitalization you go on to describe a young woman who following a right hemisphere stroke started to speak of herself solely in the third person and uh, that's not to say that most people who because some people just do this anyway but this is fascinating it's particularly fascinating because a lot of schizophrenics do talk of themselves in the third person, and so do uh, autistic children very often. So uh, one of the signs of autism in children is that they don't say, I want something, they say he, or even use their name, want something. Um, but in schizophrenia, what you find is that voices um, speak in their heads. Now, uh, typically in depressive delusions or in manic delusions, so delusions in the affective psychoses, the ones that are emotional psychoses, have different qualities from schizophrenia. The voices speak to the person. They say, you're a piece of shit. Why don't you just kill yourself? Things like that. And in schizophrenia, more commonly, the voices talk about the person. They're coming obviously from that person's mind, although they don't appreciate that at the time. And they hear these voices saying, did you see that? Did you see what he did? He's, he's, he's a hopeless case. He really ought to kill himself. Why, why does he even carry on? So they, they, they discuss him. Um, and so that's a, a, a very interesting point because, of course, it's also rather like the... I have always felt, found rather unpleasant and to some extent false way in which one has to write up a scientific experiment. You can't say, I took a beaker, I filled it to a certain level, I put it in a you know, fume cupboard, I did whatever it was. Um, no, it all has to be done. It was placed. So everything is in the passive and in the impersonal. And... Yet, the business of science is very active and can't help being personal. One of the things I argue is that there is place for the idea of objectivity. Objectivity is a, a noble aim. 
But it, it's a fantasy to suppose that it's best achieved by trying to remove anybody at all from the picture. Because once you start removing humanity from the picture, you have drastically changed everything you're doing. This is a point that's been made by many scientists themselves. So instead, what I should say is, rather than try to inhabit no point of view at all, what Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, calls the view from nowhere, which doesn't exist, um, one has to accept that actually standing aside and inventing a place from which there are, in which there is no commitment of the person to what they're seeing is also a position. It's also got its own values buried in it. It's not that you've avoided that. You've just got a very peculiar single point of view. So the better way to achieve objectivity is to occupy a number of different perspectives on this to see that you've got as much out of it as you possibly can. So I believe in objectivity, but I don't mean by objectivity the business of pretending that no human being played any part in this process. In I said we wouldn't have a chance of getting through the amount of content. We certainly won't. Nobody will, by the way. So I don't feel bad. <laughs> but we're going to come back and do another part on both perception, because attention without perception is just only half the picture. And then we're going to do a little bit on intuition as well. So at this stage, I just want to say thanks again for your time. It's always such a pleasure. Author of The Matter With Things, Ian McGilchrist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we finish, just want to thank our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. See you very soon.